Hi everybody, I'm Phoenix Perry and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about games creation as a kind of practice-based pedagogy as a creator myself. And I'm gonna share with you so much information. All of the slides that I have created today are research-backed and there are links to big lengthy lit reviews, many page studies and all kinds of other information in these slides. And I want you to know, you can find them on my Twitter and I'll also email them to you. And all that is going to be at the end of the talk. So just at the end of the talk, make sure to pull your phone out and you can screenshot that and the slides, they'll be on my Twitter. So don't panic, but all of this stuff is backed up and you can get access to it later. And I'm doing that because I have really loaded this talk with so much information that I hope new games folks will be able to use, educators will be able to action, and games creators like myself will be able to kind of, you know, take from when they're building out their syllabuses and their classes based on game creation. Okay, with no further ado, I am going to kick it to my slides. Um, so games creation is practice-based pedagogy. Cool. So I'm going to kick it off by debunking some misconceptions about games. And these all fall into the games are category. <laughs> games are bad for you. Games are this. Games are that. Um, some really interesting facts that you can use when you're talking to people is actually, guess what? Games... <laughs> are not really addictive to general audiences. And there's more evidence to support the counterclaim to that, that games are not addictive to general audiences. However, when I was doing the research, one thing that kind of really struck me that I came across and I stopped and I read like nine times that I hadn't run across before is that games that are really addictive have these kind of triple A flow based immersive systems inside of them. And they have a comorbidity with depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, and substance abuse. Now, correlation does not equal causation and way more research needs to be done here. But it absolutely got my attention because these are folks who are already dealing with some kind of imbalances in their brain structure. And it makes sense that their brains would be more vulnerable, vulnerable to like exploits such as flow based games, which uses kind of dopamine structure, which I'll talk about here in a second. And it turns out not all the game interaction loops are equivalent. Some of them do really different things in our brains. So flow based games kind of really focus on immersion and immersion and flow have now gotten so intermarried speaking about them individually is basically impossible. So flow is this idea that uh, comes from like Chicks Mill High and it kind of is this idea of creating interactive experiences that sit somewhere between a challenge and the person who's using it or doing it skill. So basically as your skill increases, the challenge increases and it never gets too hard that you can't do it and you give up are too easy, you get apathetic and bored. And the chart over here um, <laughs> will give you all that information in a, a handy dandy graph. So now these kinds of games are actually associated with a decrease in frontal brain activation. And that is a part of our brain that is completely activated when we're solving hard problems, when we're moving around in the environment, and when we're interacting with other people. So is it really any surprise that the cliche of the gamer is antisocial, they lack awareness of others, and are associated with a lack of physical awareness? Well, if you're turning down the part of people's brains, it's, it, it kind of makes sense that perhaps this might be part of an unhealthy cycle in AAA games, which are literally all about kind of getting people to buy things. Um, and it turns out not all loops in games are the same, and you can actually create interaction loops using other psychological foundations. And one of my favorite is Tend and Befriend. And this is a game loop that has been really rising in popularity. I think Brie Code with her game Self Care really brought this into a, like the public awareness. And this is a loop that's based on the kind of oxytocin 
chemical in our brain. And oxytocin is like the love-based chemical where dopamine is kind of like the immediate gratification reward chemical. Um, We get oxytocin like when we touch another person, when we get a hug, it is the love chemical. It's what calms us. It it kind of gives us peace. And it's really a very different loop. Instead of being this kind of quick hit of adrenaline and excitement, it's this soothing, calming chemical. Um, and it's associated with pro-social behavior. It's associated with better mood. There's all kinds of things that oxytocin does for us. Um, and this loop really encourages a calm awareness, transformation, reflection, happiness, growth, and really pro-social behavior. And it's a very different loop than the dopamine loop. The dopamine loop that I mentioned before before it's actually designed into most casino games. If you give somebody an uncertain reward every so often, they'll go back and they'll constantly keep playing a game. And this works with most mammals, it works with dogs, it works with birds. Um, Those are two that I've seen other studies on. But this loop, this kind of oxytocin loop is really a very different approach. And I think it's something we could really think about when we are encouraging students to make games in the classroom. So some good examples here are self-care, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I've included a screenshot of my favorite one to play, uh, Rudy, I think is maybe how that is said. It is a gardening game of succulents that you play kind of asynchronously and you care for this garden. You decorate the pot, the flowers grow. It's this very relaxing game. It always calms me down. I play it when I'm just really stressed out. Stardew Valley is another one. It's a game about caring for your environment, building social connections, relationships. Little Witch in the Woods, if you're looking for a lesser known one, is a Korean game that has a gardening mechanic in it that's quite lovely. So evidence for educational games across topics is still growing and more research is really needed in this field. There's a need for edgy games or edu games or educational games and serious games to incorporate more stakeholders and creators to deliver better experience to learners. And what I mean by that, quite frankly, is most educational games are not very good. And this has to do with the fact that they're not really engaging games creators. (laughs) They're getting made in these kind of research contexts without any situation in or situating in kind of like the overall game game landscape a real example of a game that doesn't do this it's a really successful educational game is frog fractions which is made by great games creators has a really rewarding like play mechanic and is super fun Um, but the problem with all this stuff is there not enough pedagogical frameworks in place yet or recommendations for educators who want to bring games into the classroom. So that needs a lot more work. One of the things I'm going to kind of drive home though is mechanics teach different things. And what I mean by mechanics is you can think of them as the verb in video games. It's what you do. So like jumping is a mechanic solving a puzzle, uh, adding if it's a math game, um, hiding if it's hide and seek. These are the mechanics in a game. So some good examples. So strategy games. So puzzle games can require resource management, problem solving, and have very specific cognitive demands. A really great example of a game like this that has huge payoffs across a, a large range of skills is chess. And I think if we look towards chess as like a really good example of how you could use strategy games to kind of stimulate prefrontal activation, um, I think that would be a really interesting area for research in STEM related learning games. And some other tips and things I found across that you'll see in the links below is that um, games that teach things do best with like out having narrative involved. They do best with strip back graphics. 2D graphics are more than enough. They like to just focus on kind of an abstraction and chess is really good at this. Like the narrative frame of chess is basically non-existent. It's super loose, right? Um, And that really works well for helping people learn because then they can focus on the problem solving and not the, the other stuff in the world. So a flip of that is actually 
you know, where chess is really good for strategy and STEM based stuff. I actually think that LARP is incredibly good for humanities and for history and all kinds of amazing social science research. And live action role playing is focused on lived experience in the world. And you have to really realize it's been being used around the world for years now. And it, I've got some really great links below. Folks have been using it to do things like teach creative writing, tr teach history, have students really put themselves into a kind of context to understand the situation and relatedness of the, the problems they're looking at. So one of my favorite examples I've run across is by Philip Bird and Evan uh, McCrony. Uh, they invited ninth graders to kind of live in this world, this future world called cataclysm, and using creative creativity and collaboration, they encouraged characters to be developed, they generated dialogue, they created plot twists, and I just thought this was such a brilliant way to teach creative writing. And I think that creating these LARPs might be a really, really profound way to get students excited about topics like social studies, creative writing, uh, history. So teaching games for teaching 24th century, uh, 21st century skills, 24th century, wouldn't that be nice? pandemic time. Uh, so for teaching 21st century skills. And what I mean by this is I think that games are really good at teaching the skills you need right now when you leave school and go into the work uh, workforce. A big one being storytelling. I think that people underestimate how important like storytelling is in our society right now. It's basically what's running social media. Um, time management organization. You have to do that if you want to make a game. Uh, on the fly situation based learning. And what I mean by this is games are really hard. <laughs> Making them requires like a very adaptive ability to just pick up new skills and implement them on the fly. Community and collaboration. So I think as educators, 80% of our job is actually just creating community in our classrooms and the rest of the problem solves itself, <laughs> kind of. And I, I think games creation really can help you do that by like building these really robust relationships. It also, uh, games also encourage advanced problem solving. And what I mean by this is problems that are so difficult you can't find the answer on YouTube. Um, they are also great at overcoming perfectionism through rapid iteration and failure. What I mean by that is if a student sits on a game or a group of students sit on a game, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> the only way they're able to make it good is rapidly iterating it based on player feedback. And that loop is actually really something that I think could be leveraged in really amazing ways in our society. And we could get better at like using games to help people understand that, you know, it's okay to suck at something a little bit. <laughs> In fact, just present what sucks and ask for opinions and thoughts and grow from there. So also I think building creative uh, projects and exhibiting them creates confidence in folks. I think it, if you make a game and you show it to other people and you put it on itch or take it to a game jam, uh, it's a really big deal. Like you gain a lot of strength from that. So I'm going to give you a example of using creative practice to teach computational environments. This is a unit I created. So I could make games with my students at uh, the CCI, the Creative Computing Institute at the University of Arts London, where I'm currently a course leader. Um, so the learning objectives of this unit are rapid prototype, pitch and execute a playable experience in a complex spatial environment. Leverage the body in advanced ways in playable spaces. Perform user tests and analyze player results. Um, use uh, innovative sensory triggers and digital information in physical environments. Create inno innovative, like interactive playable spaces, which use narrative in an environmental context. Um, and basically, these are all the things that you really kind of need if you're going to go out into the industry and make work in public space. So theories to support doing this kind of games-based creation. So this is what I think is actually really interesting. Here's the theory that's underpinning why I'm doing this in the classroom. And I also teach it to the students because I think it's important that they understand it. 
So material engagement theory, I absolutely love this stuff. Like I've <laughs> run across a lot of things in the last five years, but the thing that I've really resonated with me is this, this idea of material engagement. And it is from anthropology, not education, not computer science, not anything in human computer interaction. It's from anthropology. And it's this idea that the things and the tools that we use actually change the structure of our brains. And I'm going to say that again, the tools that we make when we use them change the actual structure of our brain. And there's a lot of research that backs this kind of theory up. And this book on material engagement is absolutely, I, I very rarely recommend books in their, <laughs> recommend books in their entirety, but I'm going to recommend this book. Um, it's absolutely fascinating and an eye opener. And it looks at the way that things like stone napping really helped change the way the human brain was developing because of the changes in manipulation of the tool itself. And this kind of iterates through our, our society. Tool use is actually really important to how our minds function and work in the world. And that is actually really, really kind of revelatory if you start applying it to computer technology and interactive systems, right? That means these interactive systems we're building are actually changing our brain structure quite possibly and could lead to evolutionary changes in us. And I find that really fascinating. And it's a huge, huge call to arms to learn through making, to learn through doing and building with each other, because that is actually how our minds make sense of the world. So Another really incredibly fascinating paper that I have read is on distinguishing epistemic from pragmatic action by uh, Chris and Maglio. So this paper presents two different ideas and there are two different ways in which we move or kind of take action in the world or in the environment. One is epistemic action and one is pragmatic action. So pragmatic action is actions that change the world. So throw a ball, hits a wall, pragmatic action, right? Epistemic action is action that changes the nature of our mental tasks. And what really caught my attention about this paper is they study this through the game Tetris. So they watched people play Tetris and they observed how often they rotated the pieces. And it turns out people on average were rotating the pieces way more than they strictly needed to, to solve the puzzle. And it presented quite a bit of evidence that they were thinking through the problem while rotating the pieces. And, and that is, really kind of profound because it says that we're offloading some of the cognitive solving power to the kind of controller and the rotation of the piece in space. And if you've taught math, you see this all the time. Another really clear example of cognitive offloading onto the kind of tool itself is math. So long form division, we write the problem out, we could be very difficult to solve it in our heads, but we have a system for offloading some of the memory um, while we do the math and we move through the long division, right? And at the end, we have the solution. That is a really obvious example of offloading our cognitive ability onto the page. So if we are kind of thinking through our tools and they're changing our minds, it's just a really strong really profound set of evidence. And this comes from, um, this bit of research comes from human computer interaction that we maybe should be thinking about how we are using and making with technology. So the other ideas that I think are really relevant to teaching just full stop are inactive and embodied cognition. And I like radical, um, embodied cognition quite a lot. It's actually pretty fascinating stuff. But this is kind of a inactive cognition really puts an emphasis on the iterative, temporally extended and dynamic nature of embodiment. 
And what that means is our bodies kind of extend through our tools into the environment we are in. And this is very temporary and it changes over time. So a really good example is if someone hits you in your car, you don't say, my car was hit. You say, I got hit right? Like your mind has merged around the car while you have been in it in your environment. Now there's a really tight coupling between a person and their environment. Turns out you make sense of the world through the environment you know, which is no, should be no surprise to any of us. But if you put a space alien onto the planet Earth today, they would have no context. They would have no ability to I'm sorry about that. I'm turning this off. <laughs> they would have no ability to understand any of the context of the environment that they were finding themselves in. A really interesting example of this is landing. If you're going to Iceland, landing on a plane and looking out the window, you have no idea of scale because there are no trees. And most of us have learned to make sense of scale through trees and height when we're like landing in a plane. Um, so this is the other thing that I find really fascinating about this, and it comes from frogs' eyes. So it turns out that they discovered that frogs' eyes have cells in them that see flies, that like literally are aware of, of flies. They, the cells recognize the fly, they tighten the pupils, and the, the frog reacts to it before the frog's brain ever gets involved. And it turns out that distributed cognition throughout our bodies is actually a thing. We do this too. We have them in our gut. We've had them in other parts of our body. The more they research, the more they find. And I think this is really super fascinating because it means that our bodies and our positioning in our environment is actually kind of changing what we're able to sense and see and be and think and that's just really fascinating stuff to me because that means when somebody's in the classroom, that's their environment, right? And some part of them is going to be reacting to that environment that you're creating, that community of students you're creating in the room. So I'm going to go a bit more into the tend and befriend loop because it's really important to the theory of the project that is going to be presented here. So basically this is a really common, and I, I think that it has, my critical eye looks at the gendering going on in it and it raises eyebrows. I think that this could be <laughs> potentially labeled, um, you know, Western male hormonal response. <laughs> um, but I don't like breaking things down in gender like this, but I think it's really interesting to note that our society is developed this way. Um, and these are loops based on being in and impacting an environment with a community of people. So there's no adrenaline in these loops. There's no fight or flight response. It's actually a completely different stress response. And women have exhibited more frequently tend to befriend responses in our society presently. The word female can, can go away now, but, um, tend to befriend does something really different. So fight or flight, we're really familiar with our flight slash freeze slash fight, flight. Um, so fight is obviously off with their heads. Freeze and flight is Brexit. What's Brexit? I have no idea. I'm here. Pandemic. What pandemic? I have no idea. But tend to befriend is the opposite. Ten goes, we must first look after the most vulnerable in our community. And befriend is let's come up with solutions together as a team. And this is an even better way because it helps move your society and your group forward in times of stress. Um, so maybe don't make a judgment call about it, but it's a very different response. And I think that it helps, helps our society and where we need to be going and where we need to be headed. Um, so with the project that I did with my students, I wanted to make sure that when I came into the classroom, I gave them a frame. So as an artist, I had a show coming up and I had a show at an exhibition at a museum in London called Welcome Collection. And this is a pretty high profile <laughs> museum. It's one of the larger ones in London. It's super beautiful, well-funded, funds most of the medical research in the UK. And I as an artist knew that I was going to get a really amazing opportunity to make a piece of work for this space. But I thought to myself, how amazing would it be to encourage my students to make something with me? And 
let that be a learning process for them. So when they had to go make these spatial environmental games and installations, they would have seen what it would be like to work with an actual institution, to deal with a curator, to negotiate a contract, to do all the detailed management of installing, and to solve all the problems that can kind of come up when you're creating an environment together. So I wanted to start with this is my frame. And I had been working on a project earlier called Night Games, and it had a couple pieces that I wanted to take into this new piece of work because I thought it was relevant and something that really resonated with me. And I've long since been a fan of making games about the environment and the climate crisis had been gaining attention. It was early 2020 and late 2019, depending on when you're looking at in the term, we started before 2020. It started kind of, I guess, at the fall term in 2019. And the uh, Extinction Rebellion had been going on really strong in London, particularly in our neighborhood. And I thought it would be really good to do a game that thought about climate change, thought about environment. And I had this pre-existing structure from Night Games, which was a kind of geodesic sound dome and you could change different landscape sounds on it uh, using this tree and I thought maybe I could give them this as kind of a initial frame like hey here's a big object it'll fill this massive nine meter by nine meter space we're going to be in um, let's make something with it so this was kind of how I I, I created a beginning of facilitating what was going to be the design process. So I took them all the way through a design loop. Like we researched the space, we researched the climate crisis, we started researching different things we could do and that that research process kind of led to a brainstorming uh, thing we did together. Um, I kind of acted as the note taker on the whiteboard at the front of the room, which you know, I'm sure many of you have done before. And, you know, there was all kinds of fun out there ideas about using dry ice and using smell, like trying to capture the smell of trees, have a sort of breathing forest. Like uh, there was a lot of interest in sound baths that had been something that some of the students had experienced and were interested in. Uh, forest bathing is what it's called. I guess it's a, a big thing in Japan and it was something that they were really interested in exploring. Uh, we thought we could use fake grass to hide the, the cables. Uh, some of them had this beautiful idea of putting mirrors kind of in the room in interesting ways. There were just all these really beautiful ideas that came out of uh, our brainstorm. So um, another thing there that I'll mention early, uh, early on is we had decided to work with Bing Kelly, who was a sound designer working at the CCI. And he'd been going to record the sound of the Wampi Indians in uh, the Amazon because their environment was being threatened by um, over deforestation. And he was working with a group of activists um, within the, the Wampi to try and stop that. And he'd been recording the changing soundscape. And we thought that if he would work with us, he would have the right sounds to kind of bring into the room. So I decided to constrain the problem space for them. So what I said is, we're going to make this game, it's going to have a tend and befriend loop. But I want to make sure it includes group collaboration. And you know, that it includes this kind of caring for the environment in the space. So with that, we came up with solutions together. Uh, some of the most interesting ones ended up being a complete disaster. So we decided to build this forest and we decided to work on this like low poly video game aesthetic, kind of inspired by the geodesic dome. And one of the things that I love the most were these gorgeous paper trees and had a, a heavy in, um, kind of influence on, I think, origami and that the kind of shapes began evolving and getting cooler and they kind of were resonating with a cloud structure I'd had in the previous version that I never ended up really using and they, they just ran with it and they riffed on it and they built these beautiful trees but in the end they kind of didn't come out and we got the real ones cut and assembled and we took them to the museum and we put them up and within seconds they like 
fell down. They like did not even withstand two kids testing on them. So we had to like the night before the show, like completely build a new solution. We came up with this acrylic solution. And the reason we went with acrylic is we thought, um, first of all, it was reclaimed. So we were able to get it used, which was important to us because, you know, it was a a piece about climate change. (laughs) And it was also something that we were able to kind of make robust enough, but also use the materiality, this like synthetic materiality to kind of resonate and play off the soundscape to make people kind of think a little bit about how synthetic the trees in the in the urban environment were. So the work is situated in the context in which it's gonna be seen. And this was really important to me um, as a creator, we had to make the work in the space and it was only through kind of working in the space together that we were really able to identify and solve the problems. You'll see the trees down here, um, right over here that are going so cattywampus. Uh, We got them all put together and they just did not uh, withstand the situation. And that was something that we learned by working and building in context um, of the museum itself. So the world will teach way more than you can. So opening this exhibition, they had to deal with what would happen when the public interacted with it. And they had to kind of record and think about and write about how people interacted with the experience. And to me, this was actually really important, the kind of decompressing process. So, so many things were learned. Uh, They really did successfully create a very, very tend and befriend game loop. There were all these mini games around the space that kind of deepened as you, you played them and they kind of were all collaborative across the room. And they created this really lush environment where people just laid on the floor for hours Um, One of the things that surprised me, though, were the cushions that we had chosen to put in the space became one of the most enjoyable things. So there's a bunch of stacking involved and folks moving them around in all kinds of fun and interesting ways. Um, So the stacking thing is you can see it clearly if I turn the video off. um, It's there in the bottom and rolling the cushions and laying on the cushions and moving the cushions into separate spaces and inventing mini games. And they just recorded all of this throughout the day. And and at the end, we had a really long conversation about how um, what we had anticipated did not happen (laughs) and new things instead had happened. And I thought that was really powerful. So another thing I did in this, which is really controversial, is I let um, one of my students fail hard. And he had failed to meet a bunch of the deadlines, and he had failed to do the physics, even though he had been warned about them. Um, And he had this idea of making the clouds move up and down. So they have these clouds that kind of, this is at the last minute, um, they decided to take all the failed trees and make them clouds. And I, I knew that we were going to be in trouble because of the weight of them. Um, but I let this student uh, give it his go, work himself like very late and still be completely unable to solve this challenge. I really doubted he was going to be able to pull it off. Um, and that's because like there's no way you can kind of put a hack together that fast. I mean, it could work, but the chances that you're going to not have the right weights, you end up trying to use multiple water bottles with black tape. He tried different motors. And in the end, you know, literally minutes before the installation, I was like, okay, A for effort, (laughs) but this is not going to work. Uh, And I let him just keep grinding down that loop. And the reason for that is I think sometimes he learned more through that experience of like trying and trying and trying and failing, 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 than if it would have actually worked and I would have given him the possible solution. So allowing for failure and iteration is really important in these environments. So then we all met and we really reflected on the feedback we got from everybody who played the game. We had noticed all of this new behavior that we hadn't designed for. We saw really clear examples where we had not gotten it right um, and things we could have done better. And we really kind of reflected on that theme ba- feedback and things we would change if we could do it again. So it's like, oh, here's what we learned. Um, here's what we took from it. 
And the most important thing is it really cohered them as like a cohort and a group. After that, they were rock solid. So this um, next thing we did was provide a second opportunity to iterate. And they actually had a third opportunity when they were supposed to build something in public space on their own, but the pandemic came and rained on our parade. So the second opportunity was just an attempt to take the shell that we'd made from Forest Daydream and then let them make a new set of art for it. We did this at the Tate Exchange in uh, London, which the Tate's a, a rather nice gallery, and we built these fun, you know, little tables, and there was a lot more art this time, there were a lot more interactions, and it was a much more open space, so we didn't have control over the darkness, so things were uh, moved and changed, and this isn't the final installation, it was just the uh, installation opportunity to show a photo here of an in-progress shot, but what this began doing was really fostering a studio culture, and it was a culture of people working together and collaborating, and to me that was like really good, the culture had come together, the the group had really formed their own identity as a kind of creative unit, and uh, the dean at CCI, which is kind of like the person who runs the school where I work, said uh, the Forest Dream uh, project produced a kind of studio culture that meant the lab space became more active and students became more confident in their practice and more self-directed in their project work after. And um, this was really big because before this, the lab had been empty. Nobody had been coming in, nobody had been working together. After this, the lab was super packed. <laughs> People were in there all the time and so much more interesting work got made because they'd had to learn how to build together. They'd had to learn through making what it would be like to actually create something in a big public space. And they knew that they could count on each other and they knew each other's skill sets a bit better. Um, so here's some takeaways from this that I hope you can weave into whatever you do next. Um, so the biggest thing you should emphasize when you're bringing games into the classroom is actually just the design process, right? So the creative problem solving process. Uh, play testing kind of gives you group and peer learning, right? You learn from what people do. Iteration will teach failure and growth. And there's all these really cool things you get from just the design process that games are just sort of a shell for. Um, you can also really start off the computer with the design problem space, right? When we began making this project, we really didn't start on our computers until we had an idea for what we were going to do. And we had all these design ideas and solutions and, um, we built mood boards and everything before we even tackled what the game design would be. Um, a constraint is a really good thing. So I limited the feature set and kind of the topic. Um, and that actually was really helpful. I told them that they had to work with a very specific loop um, and that they had the constraint of, you know, working with collaborative games. And from there, they were able to really kind of take those constraints and run with them. So expose students to the kind of entire design interaction loop, like let them make stuff, let them fail, let them iterate, let them make again. And that's, I think, a really powerful uh, way to teach design, but also teach all these other skills like problem solving and storytelling and collaboration and community building. So think about co-creation as a design challenge versus just a programming challenge or a game creating challenge. I think a lot of people mess up when they think that making a game will teach you to code. It's not really just that. You may learn to code if you make that kind of game, but you would get just as much out of making a card game or making a LARP. And I think it's really important to know that you can use games outside the kind of STEM context. And I, that's, I know that's an incredibly popular context for games. And I think it misses the entire offering um, on the table. So here's some cool books to get you started. Um, I really like Games Design and Play, A Detailed Approach to Iterative Game Design by John Sharp and Colleen Macklin. And a lot of the things that I presented here today are really based on what I've taken away from that book over the years. Um, the Art of Game Design by Jesse Shields is a good one. Um, 
and it's just very pragmatic game design book. Uh, so tools to make games without coding. Here's a bunch of them. Uh, Bitly, GameMaker, Twine, Godot, Scratch, GD Develop, RenPy, Pi Game, Construct 2. Uh, I think I have Construct spelled wrong. It's not con. Okay, you get the idea. Construct 2. Um, and I will, uh, I don't think it's Bitly. I think it's Bitsy. <sighs> What a mistake. Anyway, I'll correct this slide when I put it up. So <laughs> this is me not trusting the spell check and just running past this. So, um, and here's some cool things you can kind of get free assets and free sounds from. So freesound.org, opengameart.org. Itch.io is great for assets, actually. It's a good games exhibition platform where you can have students post their work, but also has a ton of free assets. Uh, and then blender.org is a great 3D uh, tool for games. Free games related tools, Audacity, GIMP, Blender. These are all like audio and graphics creation tools. So Freeish, Unity, and Unreal. Um, and the cool thing is Unreal is node-based. Um, Unity has a node-based tool. What I mean by that is you don't have to code. You just have to start thinking about the logic of coding. Um, which is pretty powerful. But they do have publishing agreements. So there's that. All right. Cool. This is where you can find me on Twitter and via email. So get your phones out now. Um, screen cap. I guess we're not actually in a place where you can take a photo. So maybe <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. But uh, either screen cap, grab a photo, whatever it works for the context in which this is going to be viewed. And uh, yeah, cool. All right. That's it for me.